Please welcome our guest, Tom Cole. It's great to see you. Peter, a small fraction of what you said was actually true and correct. Dave, that was amazing. I would have cried. I'm crying now. I mean, that, wow. What a gift. What a gift for all of us. And I, as, as a guy that's paid for two wed weddings, I just decided there's, there's the hard way and the easy way. The easy way is expensive, but it's the easy way. So uh, if, if you haven't done that yet, good luck. Um, but it's great to be here today. I want to thank Paul. Uh, I've been involved with NCS for 14 years now, and just uh, the faithfulness that Paul has shown to this organization. He's run the national organization. He's always jumping in and helping us with various issues. He keeps track of our important history, and showing up here every week, uh, it takes time. And, and he obviously scraped the bottom of the barrel today uh, to get me. Um, I would never characterize myself as an author or as a speaker I, uh, since I wrote this book, I haven't spoken once yet, I don't think, so <laughs> this is an inaugural uh, visit. But um, NCS is really special to me, and I want to I start with a uh, commercial from our sponsor. So why did I show you that? I'm just a guy that's got a story, and all of you have a story. And that Chick-fil-A video really uh, has struck me for one primary reason. Um, it said everyone has a story, all of you have a story, and all you have to do is bother to read it. Now, I'll take exception to that one point because as I look at everyone out in this room, as I look at the video that I just saw, I could have never predicted the stories, that the bubbles that were popping up above people's heads. Some incredibly joyful, some incredibly painful. And ever since I've seen that video, when I walk down the street, I think of myself, I wonder what side of the coin they're on today. And I know in a room like this, there's guys that have to be going through some tough, tough stuff. And I know there's guys that are celebrating. And maybe like Dave, there's guys that feel a little of both, that feel, you know, beautiful weekend. I lost my daughter. And so um, I'm just on that journey myself, guys. I've had great bubbles uh, in my life, and I've had uh, some tough bubbles. Um, you know, in the office, uh, I had a, a client sue my former employer for $13.9 billion and put me at the center of that lawsuit. Uh, I've had a guy that worked for me that accused me of uh, sexual harassment that required a big investigation. That obviously was a lie. Um, on the home front, I got out of the gate slow in the marriage category. We struggled for a number of years, and that uh, all blew up uh, when my wife filed for divorce just before our 20th uh, anniversary in a very public fashion. Um, I've had issues with children. Uh, I've got a son who's had open heart surgery. Uh, he got a gene that I passed along to him. That, uh, th that caused him to need very severe open heart surgery, a unique procedure that saved his life at the Cleveland Clinic. And one of the reasons I wrote this book is I, I thought about, that was a very clear uh, example of, I passed along to him that problem in a much larger exacerbated fashion than I have myself, because I've got that gene. And I started thinking to myself, what else have I passed along to my kids, both good and bad? And so as I wrote this book, I thought about, you know, what do I want to leave my kids? I've had health issues myself. October 26, 2014, uh, I was in great shape. I was working out at a swimming pool, and I didn't feel quite right, and basically was uh, rushed to a hospital in an ambulance, pandemonium, pandemonium everywhere. I'm gasping for air. They basically say, you're having a heart attack, we're going to bring you into the cath lab and we might have to open you up, you know, sign these releases. And I don't know, most of you probably have had the experience of just kind of laying on one of those gurneys and staring on the ceiling and thinking about life. Maybe not in a life or death situation, but there's something about, you know, 
someone's going to go do something to you and it's totally out of your control. Uh, and the dominant thought that went through my head at the time was you haven't poured enough wisdom yet into the lives of the kids. And I would have never predicted that that would have been the dominant thought. Um, I'm glad that God gave me that dominant thought. I think that dominant thought came because I was in a very intense career that caused me to largely be away from home during the kids' formative years. So I think that was you got to make up for some lost time. Uh, I didn't think about work. I didn't think about what I left behind at the office. There wasn't any unfinished business. I wasn't afraid of dying. I was secure in my faith. But that was the dominant thought that went through my mind. And then on February uh, 9th of 2018, I had another heart attack, uh, which was a bit of a fluke, but it was the same thing, you know, rush into the cath lab and not know if they're going to have to open you up or not. And so, you know, I'm like, I, I better doc. I, start, I had gotten more intentional about teaching my kids things and sending them things, but I don't know if any of you have kids in, in their teenage years or in their 20s, but... Most of the lengthy emails I send them, you know, they say I'll get around to it later. So I said, I don't know how long I'm going to be around. I mean, one thing everyone can agree with on this world is we're all going to die someday. Uh, so I said, I got to document this. I, 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 I want to write down on paper what I want my kids to know about life, which caused me to do a lot of self-reflection as well. Uh, so I retired last April, so this is the first thing I did in my retirement, and I'm thinking... Like, what would, how would you answer that question? Like, what's the most important thing? If you had to say, boil it down to one message, what, what would you say? And fortunately, uh, Jesus delivers pretty clear messages so that guys like me can understand them. And it, it's not that complicated. And look, I'm all about Bible studies. I'm all about being in the Word every day. But Jesus pretty much boiled it down, right? Matthew 22, you know, what's the most important commandment? Oh, love God and love your neighbor. And the Bible's a love story. And it's not the emotional love, it's the doing love. It's the sacrificial love. It's the giving love. It's the inconvenient love. It's the I'm going to be with you covenant love for the rest of my life. And... Um, Love God, love your neighbor. And as part of how do you love your neighbor? You give of yourself. You know, in, in the world today, we're getting bombarded with, it's all about you finding things for you. You finding comfort in your life. If only you had this, you'd be happy. Right? Scripture's a totally countercultural message of, wait, let me get this right. Like, for me to find my best life, I have to give myself away? Is that, is that really where I'm going to find joy and happiness? And I think as we think through our lives, as I think through my life, that's certainly been the case. So I, my, my three kids, um, I would call them seekers. You know, they're not weekly church attenders. They know I have a strong faith. They say they believe. We go to church together when we're all together. They're 31, 34, 37, so they're older. So I had to write this from the perspective of I want to be strong and clear about the promises of Jesus, but I want to try to support it with secular data. So on this topic of love, you know, there was a Harvard study done, and it's a great TED Talk if you haven't seen it, where they took uh, over 300 sophomores at Harvard, and they took 300 Irish immigrants that didn't go to college, that were really low income. And they tracked their lives for the next 80 years. And the biggest determinant of longevity, if you look at, if I look at these guys when they were 50 years old, what were the greatest determinants of happiness and longevity in their life? They interviewed them every year, they had their medical records. The biggest determinant of health and happiness was deep relationships. Totally in alignment with what Jesus said. Love God, be in real... And, and think about NCS, isn't it interesting? Friendship with Jesus, friendship with each other. Right? That's Matthew 22. 
And you go to Matthew 25, and, and Jesus is saying, hey, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you took care of me. And in, in his little parable that he's talking about, the disciples, when, when did we do this for you? And Jesus says, as you did this for the least of these, you did this for me. It's not about you. It's about how you can give some of you to people in need. And in this room, there's people in need. So my encouragement to all of you, this isn't, we have to read your story. You have to the courage to tell your story, to not be shy and say, hey, I'm struggling with this or I'm dealing with, that's what I love about this community. You don't have to stand in front of the group of everyone and talk about all your problems, but find a brother to just say, hey, you know, can you walk with me for this season? I'm, I'm struggling. Like, i I'm like, my wife didn't like me for 10 years. That was a hard struggle to constantly get rejected. Every time I tried to take a foot forward, I got pushed back. But interestingly, as I've reflected on all those times, I I have a much clearer view today why she took a step back as I took a step forward. Because there were things that I were doing that was unhealthy in our relationship, and it didn't make her feel drawn to me. So... The first lesson in this book is, you know, it's not about your money, it's not, and it's not about quantity of friends, it's about quality of friends. Warren Buffett said, how do you define success? He goes, you, when you get to my age, this might surprise you, when you get to my age, you'll define success by how many of the people you want to love you actually do love you. Because it's very disturbing for a guy like me that that's the formula. Because I'd like to buy a million dollars worth of love. And you can't buy, you can buy sex, but you can't buy love. The only way to get love is be lovable. And that takes time and that takes giving yourself. That's an inconvenience. So as I went through the whole secular ledger, and then I went through the scriptural ledger, I tried to reconcile the two so that we could pull those together. So... It's not about the money. Uh, There are studies done that show that uh, happiness, there's correlation between income and happiness up to about $75,000 a year. Maybe in this cost of living area, it's $100,000. But someone that makes $100,000 a year is no less happy than someone that makes $5 million a year. To be in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world you need a net worth of $100,000. That's the top 10% in the world. You know, we always think about comparing ourselves to the guy that lives in the big house. And we don't think about the guy or the child that's in Africa that's going to die today of starvation. I don't know what it is about us that's always looking up and never comparing to people whose circumstances might be more difficult than our own. Second thing, uh, message is live in the moment. You know, we should understand our past and we should have a plan for our future. Uh, Rick Woolworth, uh, who had gone through this program called Halftime that I'm going through now, I'm I'm trying to figure out what's going to be next for me in the next season of life. One of the things he told me and, and they teach is answer this question. What are the five things you want people to say about you at your 80th birthday party? Or for the younger guys, maybe, what are the five things you want people to say at your birthday party 20 years from now? And as I put that list together for me, I went to what Jesus said, love God, love other people. So it's follower of Jesus, number one. Faithful, loving husband, number two. Respected, admired, wise father and grandchild, number three. Loyal friend, number four and a generous servant to those in need is number five. You notice nowhere on that list was he was a good banker or he was a good swimmer. Even if I wanted to be a good golfer, I couldn't be. So that, like, achievement does not buy happiness. I mean, when you think about, think about some of the greatest athletes out there. I used to swim. Michael Phelps broke all these records and wanted to kill himself. He was depressed. Brady, after he won the third Super Bowl, he's like, is this all there is to life? Now he's gone on and won a bunch more, but I think he's still asking that question. 
Tiger Woods. Wow, look at everything he had. Best golfer ever, all the money you want, beautiful wife. The things of this world won't satisfy. And I wanted to get that message across to the kids because it's so, and I've been guilty, right? I chase them. I, like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we went on this great vacation? Or wouldn't it be nice to own this house? Like, the earlier you can realize that the things of this world will not find bring you happiness. But it's really communion with God, communion with Jesus, communion. We were made for community, communion with brothers. And I think friendship's one of the most misunderstood concepts in the world today. As I think about um, the internet, social media, I'm not on social media. Um, Just think of how, you know, people like, how many friends do I have? And did they defriend? Like, who cares, right? Invest your time in two or three or four close friends. So let me tell you what I do with my Hoosier friends from, uh, from Indiana. We were college roommates. There was four of us. And uh, we kept in touch through the years. We'd do an occasional guy's trip every three or four years. We're busy raising kids. But as we got older, we said, and, and I learned this through NCS, we need to get more intentional about our friendship. Because when guys get together, we can talk for hours about nothing. And um, so, you know, we have a great time together. We get together three times a year now instead of once every three or four years. We do a Zoom call every month. It's an hour for the sole purpose of talking about what's going on in your life. That's me bringing the energy group to a secular group of friends. We have a group chat that there's always someone busting on someone. There's a lot of funny stuff. And, and, you know, the SOS, you know, SOS. We've, we've, been, we've dealt with a lot of things together, with children and wives and career issues. And, and, and our relationship has gotten so much closer just in the last 10 years as we started implementing that practice. And I think one word I just want to leave you with today is intentionality. You know, I, I've been asking the question, as I, as I filled out that what are the five things you want people to say, I've started asking the question, why? Like why? It'd be interesting for you guys to all just think, why are you here today? Why did you come? Some guys came for fellowship. Some guys came uh, to network. Some guys might think someone can help them with a job. Like All those are perfectly fine reasons. But I hope you came with the mindset of, I could really impact someone's life today. God could use me and my story to change the life of another man. I hope you view this, NCS, as your mission field. Because every life has a story, and other men need to hear your story. Your story will be an encouragement. When my wife filed for divorce, uh, a good friend of mine who was my pastor, uh, he said, come over to the house and... And uh, he gave me a vision for a better future. I mean, that's one of the lessons in the book to the kids is life is hard. Like, we don't, it's, we don't teach our kids that life is hard, but life is hard. Anything that's good in life is usually hard. You don't, you know, maybe it's not hard to win the lottery, but I don't think winning the lottery is a good thing. Anything that, that matters in life takes effort and work and perseverance and endurance. And having a guy come alongside me I love, uh, one of our our guys uses the phrase, pain shared is divided, but joy shared is multiplied. Isn't that an amazing concept in God's economy? So I had my buddy come alongside of me, and he called me every day for six months. And my faith grew like it's never grown before, because what I did is I had to tell him what was happening in my life. And every day it was something different. And he gave me advice that was grounded in scripture and as a past, you know, he's good at this stuff. I'm not as good as and he is. But he's tying every bit of practical advice to scripture. And some days it was, you're being trampled on. You got to stand up for yourself. I'm going to bring the John Townsend book boundaries over to your place right now. Are you, are you home? I'm, I'm on my way. Other days it was, you just said something bad about your wife. Guard your tongue. How, how are you doing at loving your wife? You know, I, I read in the Bible lots, love your enemy, right? That, that's, I read that passage with no emotion. You put a face on that. Love the person 
who just is walking away from your marriage, who's going to take half the net worth that, you know, you put your career on the pedestal and all that's going to go in an instant. And, and your dream of a good marriage is, is shattered. It's gone. And so um, having that friend that comes alongside, friendship with Jesus, friendship with each other, this inconvenient love that is so wonderful but so countercultural. So, uh, so as I looked at the future, you have a plan. So I have a plan, and that helps me prioritize what I'm doing today. So I ask myself, why? What does this have to do with my five things? Now, not everything fits neatly in a box, but uh, one of the things the halftime guys ask you to, to do is try to map out your ideal life and how you would allocate your time. That's a really hard, those are two different things. What's your ideal life and how do you allocate your time? That, that's a hard exercise. You think it's easy, but it's really, really hard. So have a plan for, for your future, but live for today. So many people are so worried about what's going to happen in the future. So many people are stuck in their past. It's important to unpack our past, to understand our past. I grew up in a home with amazing parents, incredible character, responsible, dependable um, rule following, they do anything for us. But I never heard the words, I love you. A couple of us were talking beforehand. I was never hugged as a child. And so 99% was great, but did that little piece of my childhood, has it manifested itself in some of my adult cravings? Absolutely. And so it's important to understand our past, but not get stuck in our past, right? Live for today, the, you know, AA one day at a time. And, you know, you can get overwhelmed thinking about the hole that you're in, the pit that you're in, and how I'm going to get out of it, what's my future going to look like. One day at a time, and one day at a time with a brother, because pain shared is divided. One of the things, as, as I look back on my life, there's a lot of reflecting as I wrote this. And one of the things I do say in here, you know, why the narrow gate? Um, Britt Harris came and spoke at Manhattan, and he did uh, a, a talk on, the, on that passage from Matthew 7. And I say, well, look at this gate. There's, it is from Indiana, because that's near and dear to my heart. But it's not that narrow, right? There's enough, this is a wide enough gate that you and your friends can walk through together. And it's also got some lights on it. So where do you turn to to navigate the pathways of life? And obviously there's no better place than scripture because culture is going to be trying to pull you off that narrow path and say, you know, the road to destruction is broad and attractive. The hard road, life can be difficult, but the best road is often the most difficult road to navigate. And do it with friends so you can get through. But one of the things I realized as I reflected on my life is it was in the hardest moments of life that I experienced the greatest personal growth. I don't know if you can think about that as well. But as I think of, I, I, I grew closer to Jesus as the love of this world, the love of my marriage was not satisfying. I, I, I grew in my faith immensely. I became a better father. I became a better husband. I understood my own shortcomings. One of the things you know, we talk about is forgiveness. Again, there's so many obvious things in the Bible that you read one day and then you're in the midst of the battle and you, okay, done, I forgive her. And every time I thought about I forgive her, it was followed with a and I hope she has a miserable life. And I kind of was, I wasn't overtly cheering for her to suffer. But when I would hear, you know, something wasn't, I was like, good, she's getting what's, what's due to her. And someone said, hey, you know, in the Bible, it's very clear that you're supposed to pray for those who persecute you. You're supposed to pray for your enemy. So this was a couple years after this. So I started praying that God would bless her in her life. Now, my spirit hadn't changed, my heart hadn't changed, but as I started praying that regularly, my heart softened in a major way. And I saw a mirror in front of me that I started to say, 
you know, it must have been hard to be married to me. You know, I, I, I had a very demanding job. I wasn't home a lot. I, I wasn't there to help her parent our kids. I abdicated all responsibility. I didn't want to create uh, tension in the home, so I let her make all the decisions. Um, I kept reminding her how bad our marriage was and that we had to work on it, i.e., you need to change. And so I, I had this mirror as I prayed that God would bless her that shined right on me. And so um, the difficult times in life, my son's heart condition was discovered by an organization that was set up by families who lost a kid to sudden cardiac arrest with the same disease that my son had. Family loses children, says let's make sure this doesn't happen again. This nonprofit is formed. They're at my son's school doing EKGs, and his problem is discovered. Saved his life, right? So as you get in those tough moments of time, I would say ask yourself, what's God teaching me about me? What's God teaching me about life? And how can we use this? I think God prepares us for the mission field through our greatest adversities. So I've been through a divorce. I, I should say I'm very happily married now. I've been married to Kim for 16 years I don't deserve her for a minute. I am so blessed and so lucky. I prayed so long. I wanted a good, healthy marriage and a wife that loved me. And God didn't cause my first marriage to end, but he sure answered all those prayers <laughs> in Kim. And so be, don't be discouraged when you hit those bumps in the road. Bring a brother alongside of you. Dream together about the future. Try to learn about what's, what's this teaching me about me. And now I can't tell you how many phone calls I get. Here's a guy, you know, my wife is talking about leaving me. I, I need help. Well, I'm happy to walk through. I've, I've walked in those steps. I've got a kid who's, you know, got a serious medical issue. Well, I've walked through those steps. And men here have walked with me through my darkest days. You know, I've had some, some tough days myself. So uh, as we say at NCS, uh, just show up. Just show up. And, and, and have the courage to share your story because your story is an important story. I'll finish with, uh, we, uh, I'm now involved with the Naples chapter and I, I was able to get a bunch. One of the beauties of Naples is we have a lot of visitors from out of town. Chip came and spoke. So we get some great speakers and one of the, uh, one of the guys there said to me, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of rumblings that we got too many CEOs showing up. And we've got a huge variety of people that are barely making ends meet and people that have, you know, nine figures in net worth. And, you know, our last CEO was an immigrant, communist, grew up in Yugoslavia, came to this country. I'm like, is that a CEO or is that a guy who was, you know, found himself in a whole new culture, didn't speak the language, but found Jesus and his, light went from, his life went from darkness to light. We had a CEO three weeks ago who killed his father in a DUI. Imagine that. Three days later, a guy comes into his room and leads him to Jesus and says, you can be forgiven. And he's on a mission to talk about the forgiving love of Jesus. He became CEO of a company after that accident, and every time he went on the road in his bio, his first words were convicted felon. And he's reminded of that over and over and over again. He went to jail for it. So, you know, it's not about who's up here speaking. It's really about you guys and your story. And the, all we're doing is planting seeds to give the, it's okay to not be okay. It's normal. So, I just want to plant a few of those seeds today for you guys to give you permission. Like, life's messy, but life is wonderful. I wouldn't trade my life with anybody. I've, I've had some low lows, and I've had some really high highs. And NCS has been a really, really important part of that journey and the friendships that have come alongside. So thank you for uh, taking time to listen today.